Hey everyone, today we're looking at the AMD keynote announcements for Computex 2022. AMD today announced several official details on its Ryzen 7000 CPUs, its Zen 4 architecture. It had some information on chipsets that we'll need to clarify. So there's X670, there's an X670E badge, but it's not technically a chipset. So that's something we want to point out. B650, some other stuff in the news as well. New laptops, for example, SAS, or their smart access storage technology, and a couple other things we'll go over today, like IGPs and all the CPUs. Before that, this video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is a Linux server hosting provider that GN has used for nearly a decade now for its own servers. Alongside dedicated website hosting, Linode makes it easy to cut out third-party VPN services to build your own VPN that you fully control easily configured via the interface. Linode also has hundreds of guides for custom servers, including game server apps like Rust, Minecraft, CSGO, and guides to host your own video calling servers to eliminate third parties. Linode is a great way to take back control of software and your hosting, and Gamers Nexus viewers get a $100 credit for 60 days on new accounts at linode.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. So first up, AMD is targeting fall for the Ryzen 7000 desktop launch with AM5 sockets and Zen 4 architecture CPUs. There's no firm date yet and no pricing, also no official names of the CPUs coming out. We do know there's a 16 core, we'll get into that in a bit, but beyond this, there's not much in terms of hard specs for the CPUs themselves. We do have a lot of other information though, and it's all very useful for kind of getting ahead of things. So AMD noted that its primary focus for Zen 4 architecture was to work on the clock speeds and IPC. This is in step with Zen 3, where it was working on much the same thing. So we're seeing some core count changes, but for the most part, it sounds like the focus remains on improving in areas where uh, for Zen 3, it got AMD the largest gains versus its competitor of Intel, obviously. And the two are in more direct competition now than they were in, say, 2017, 2018, where it was very much a, a very one constant one-sided battle. Either it was Intel or AMD had a very clear victory for a period of time until its competitor launched the next architecture. So we're, we're in a state where it's more head-to-head -head now. It should be very interesting for fall and for beginning of next year. So uh, another big item for Zen 4 is that inclusion of IGPs in the CPU. So integrated graphics processors will be included in the IO die. They are still multi-chiplet approaches. One of those chiplets in Zen 4 will be a an IO die that includes graphics. Regarding the IGP though, we confirmed with AMD that the included IGPs are meant primarily for diagnostic use, kind of like how you would use Intel IGPs mostly right now. Uh, the AMD IGPs are not meant to be marketed as gaming solutions, and they shouldn't be. We'll keep an eye out though. You could technically play a game on an RDNA 2 IGP in a Ryzen 7000 CPU, but it's really not meant to do 1080p gaming from our conversations with AMD. So these Ryzen 7000 CPUs are still being marketed as CPUs, not as APUs, and APUs will likely continue to be made with more powerful graphic solutions that are in fact targeted for gaming. There's a built-in encode and decode with the IGPs in the Ryzen 7000 CPUs though. So that's useful. There are use cases for that. We don't have any further information though beyond that. So the included IGP, it's really meant for troubleshooting. Uh, if you're not sure if your video card is defective when you go to turn the system on and there's no display out. Right now with Intel, if you have a non-F SKU CPU, so you have a CPU that includes the graphics processor, even if you're not going to use it for games because it's not very good for games, which is true, you can at least plug your display out into the motherboard if it has a port for it and determine if the video card is in fact the problem or not. So that's where AMD is going with this. It does allow AMD to get that, that one extra advantage. It also allows more easily deployable office systems where you don't want a video card for something that's really just doing maybe a little more advanced spreadsheet processing, but still nothing beyond that. Now, AMD's Robert Halleck said that, quote, all Ryzen 7000 series chips will have some amount of built-in graphics. Although it is possible that AMD could release an FSKU equivalent later, uh, assuming they have defective IGPs, but that isn't being announced today. AMD's Lisa Su showed off a delitted Ryzen 7000 CPU on stage at Computex and pointed out the long standing three chiplet design is still the maximum die allocation on these CPUs. AMD didn't tell us directly what CPU used in its demos, but again, looking through the legal footnotes, we learned that the testing was done on an X670 motherboard 
with a 16-core CPU, and we'll talk about the chipsets in a moment. AMD is sticking with two CPU core dies now at 5 nanometers from 7 nanometers previously, and one I.O. die at 6 nanometers. AMD's I.O. die previously was in the 12 nanometer and 14 nanometer class, so this aligns with the goal of running the I.O. die on a cheaper or a less supply-constrained process note. A lot of the other CPU or platform information was already known, but we're going to recap it briefly. One of those, Zen 4 Ryzen 7000 CPUs will support DDR5 memory. There's one really important clarification though, which is that they will only support DDR5 memory. There's no split DDR4, DDR5 like Intel Alder Lake or the 12,000 series CPUs. It is only D5. PCIe Gen 5 will be available on the platform, obviously depending on if you're using the top PCIe slot or something else, it might switch to Gen 4, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, AM4 coolers are still supported, so that's great news as well. The keypad zone specifically remains the same. So it's not just the coolers will technically work. The keep out zone is the same. Uh, the mounting mechanisms should all be the same. We didn't explicitly see a backplate. We would assume that's the same as well, though. So this is good news because coolers, they can be pulled forward without needing to retire them unless there's a massive change in the IHS or the heat density or something. AM5 CPUs will have this uniquely shaped IHS. We've seen this in the past already, though. And it is moving to LGA or land grid array for the socket type and off of PGA or pin grid array. PGA was mostly for the end user frustrating for the CPU getting ripped out of the socket if you weren't extra careful with removing the cooler. But otherwise, the pin count is limited to a lower density to fit the 90 degree angles on the CPU, whereas LGA allows AMD to achieve higher in socket pin density as seen in Intel or in AMD Threadripper boards. Okay, up next is the AM5 platform overview. So this supports up to a 170 watt TDP CPU. TDP here is not the same as power consumption, so it doesn't necessarily mean literally 170 watts is all that it supports. Uh, it just means that the calculation from AMD, which is probably the same as it's always been, where it involves uh, Theta CA and ambient TKs, things like that, uh, that will be supported up to 170 watt at least by stock. It may do more overclocking, we'll find out. Anyway, the point is, this number can't be used for direct comparison to Intel chips. In a more detailed comparison or explanation, the exact wording that AMD used was, quote, in this socket, we're going to allow CPU package power to go up to 170 watts in this generation, end quote. AMD also mentioned the updated SVI3 power infrastructure in broader terms, saying that it offers, quote, support for additional power phases fine-grained power control, and significantly faster voltage response capabilities. This, alongside the X670E badge for the X670 chipset, is good news for extreme overclocking. We're really looking forward to it, because I've got the overclocking setup over here that we haven't used yet in our new office, other than for the battle against BPS Customs previously. So anyway, we're looking forward to that. It should be fun to get into some XOC stuff with these boards, although certainly they're going to be targeted at mainstream and enthusiasts, but uh, we like that aspect. Next part of news is about the chipsets. So X670 and B650 were revealed in the keynote. These are the successors to X570 and B550 respectively. There may be more later, but not yet revealed if so. X670 has that previously mentioned extreme variant or X670E. This is overclocking focused but it isn't actually a different chipset. Instead, it's a guarantee from the motherboard manufacturer that the board will have two PCIe 5.0 graphics slots, although they would have to be run and probably by eight by eight, uh, and the non-E X670 boards are guaranteed to have one PCIe Gen 5 slot, but not necessarily two. B650 boards have only PCIe Gen 4 slots, and all three variants are guaranteed by AMD here to have at least one PCIe Gen 5 storage or M.2 slot. Now, based on past launches in terms of the launch timing, we would expect that X670 and probably E will come out first, and then the lower end boards like B650 will come out later. So uh, we'll at least start with X670. So going back to the X670E or extreme chipset thing, that's just, again, it's just a badge saying, hey, you've got more PCIe Gen 5 PEG options or PCIe graphics, and that's it. Uh, we've clarified with AMD that the chipsets announced today do not provide any PCIe Gen 5 lanes themselves. The CPU does. As a reminder, if we don't have a block diagram for the new chipsets, we'll maybe pull an Intel one up on the screen because it's the same basic idea. 
But as a reminder, there are lanes that come from the CPU itself and some of them go down to the chipset and that splits more lanes where the motherboard manufacturer can largely assign if it wants how many SATA devices, uh, one point SATA Express, things like M.2, NVMe devices, stuff like that, or more PCIe slots. And then the rest of it goes straight from the CPU to PEG or PCIe graphics. Typically, it's into the first slot, uh, and also often you get four into NVMe. Anyway, the CPU's lanes are different from the chipset's lanes, and we don't know what the chipset will carry yet. So the 24 CPU lanes always exist, but the number of them that can be physically connected and used depends on the motherboard. Four PCIe 4.0 lanes are going from the CPU to the chipset, so that's not PCIe Gen 5 either, at least from what AMD was telling us. AMD expects a number of PCIe 5.0 SSDs uh, to be equipped with a new Fizon controller, which will release alongside AM5. So there would be an option to get some extra use out of PCIe Gen 5, assuming it meets the bandwidth or exceeds PCIe Gen 4. The AM5 platform supports up to 14 USB 20 gigabit per second ports and Wi-Fi 6E which AMD claims will be commonplace on these motherboards. Of course, boards still have the option to cut some of this, maybe cut down to seven USB, for example, for cost-saving measures, or just for density-saving measures if they're already filling the I.O. with other stuff. And also, since uh, desktop chips will all be coming with IGPs, it's reasonable to expect that now there are going to be display outputs on a lot of the boards that you're seeing as well. As for motherboards coming out, AMD didn't have a ton to say about the boards initially, other than naming a couple of uh, partner motherboards and revealing some of the names of the five flagships and subsequently revealing that naming your chipset something extreme like x670 extreme gets to be a little silly when the motherboard manufacturers also use variations on spelling of the word extreme we'll put a few of them on the screen now so they overlap in ways that are at least amusing if nothing else we'll start out pretty light so there's the x670e x670 extreme tai chi board from asrock there's the biostar x670 extreme valkyrie board and uh, then there's also now we're getting into the good ones there's the msi meg x670e ace and as a reminder meg stands for MSI Extreme Gaming, so it's a self-contained acronym, kind of like GNU, and MSI stands for MicroStar International. So it's the MicroStar International, brackets, MicroStar International X670 Extreme Ace. Really burying the lead there, MSI, with the naming. Uh, and then there's also the Gigabyte X670 Extreme Extreme, but there's no E on the second extreme, so Maybe it's like a distributive math problem where it's just distributing across the parentheses. Anyway, and finally, there's the Asus ROG, or Republic of Gamers, Crosshair... Where's the name? <laughs> I lost it there for a second. The Asus Republic of Gamers Crosshair X670 Extreme Extreme, with an E, therefore better than Gigabyte's Extreme Extreme. How many extremes can we get? Let's find out in the next generation. I, for one, hope we find motherboards with at least three to four extremes in the name. They can do it. MSI, looking at you, let's do another self-contained acronym. Maybe we can change it to be MSI Extreme Gaming X670 Extreme Extreme Ace. That's a free one. You can have that idea. I haven't trademarked it. Uh, anyway, that's what we're going to be dealing with for motherboard naming for the next few years. Other than that, we can only speculate based on the images in the slide deck. All of the boards shown take two 8-pin CPU power connectors, and the ACE takes a supplementary 6-pin PCIe power connector on top of that. None of the boards contain visible active cooling on the chipset, so this is a good thing, although the fans could be hidden. But that was one of the major concerns with X570 that people really didn't like was the presence of the chipset fan, and that might be gone here. The Valkyrie is the only ATX board. Three of the other larger boards appear to use the extra space to fit an M.2 slot alongside the RAM slots. All boards other than the Tai Chi have more than two visible PCIe slots. We suspect the third slots are PCIe Gen 4, but we'll be interested to see whether that's the case given the PCIe Gen 5 Everywhere claim for X670E. Now next is SAS and hardware news last week. We talked about this a bit. We covered a new rumored smart technology from AMD. It turns out it's not a rumor. Uh, this is smart access storage. AMD has now confirmed this one. It didn't shed much light on it yet, 
But uh, like NVIDIA's RTX IO, what we do know is that Smart Access Storage enables Microsoft Direct Storage, which is a feature that was also showcased on the Xbox and inherited to the Windows platform. On AMD platforms, there will now be Smart Access Memory, or SAM for GPUs, there's Smart Access Storage, and there's the AMD GPU Asset Decompression. Even though NVIDIA got ahead of AMD on announcing its own Direct Storage technology, the number of PC games that actually use direct storage is still sitting at exactly zero. So being early didn't actually provide an advantage here. Uh, smart access storage is something we'll have to continue to just cover if or when more information is revealed or if games actually start shipping with it. So this one's kind of sidelined for now. And finally, the laptops. AMD also talked about their laptops with a focus on commercial and professional for the markets, especially for ultra thins. This section largely was just honestly advertising for the partner companies making the laptops, so we'll keep it kind of light as well since AMD was kind of light on the information. AMD also talked about their upcoming Mendocino laptops. These aren't aimed at our audience for the most part, so we'll keep it brief. Uh, Mendocino chips are four core, eight thread processors built on Zen 2 with RDNA graphics. These are aimed at mainstream notebooks. AMD put the price range at $400 to $600 for the laptops equipped with these chips. AMD also showed some new designs for gaming laptops like the Lenovo 7 Legion gaming laptop. This comes equipped with four sensors in the WASD keys that detect how hard you're pressing the key. Alienware also has a laptop. We assume that it has extra features as well, but we couldn't find them buried under the warranty information, so we're going to move on. The most interesting laptop AMD discussed is the Corsair Voyager, which was also in the rumor mill last week. Besides being Corsair's first laptop, it's also aimed at streaming and it makes use of Corsair's subsidiary Elgato. The top of the keyboard, for example, has 10 additional keys, which are tied to Elgato's streaming software. The laptop has a 1080p what they call high fidelity camera that is also tied to Elgato software. And the target here is clearly some form of be a streamer on the go type of situation. How useful that'll be will remains to be seen. Laptops are uh, maybe they're a little questionable for a lot of the, the use cases you would be in as a streamer, but maybe it's good enough. All the gaming laptops that AMD discussed, including the Lenovo Legion 7, the Corsair Voyager and the Alienware warranty, all of these will use AMD Advantage for the suite of technologies, which is another badge like X670E, and those will be coming out this summer. So that's it for the main round of AMD news. If there's interest in any particular topic here, let us know which one you're the most looking forward to learning more about. We'll start digging into it more as AMD is able to launch or release more information and uh, get some more videos up. So thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess where we just released a new behind the scenes post and video.